Welcome back to the Wheel of Time talk show. Welcome back. We're so excited to have you here. But before we talk about the Wheel of Time, there's something important that we have to talk about. Something very important. Something very important. I know that it's very important because approximately 4 million people tweeted me about it. Um, and I do, you know, despite making that joke, I'm, I, I do want to say that I'm thankful to all of you for sending this to me. Uh, somebody did a food heist on Christmas Day. Wow, bold. Yes. Stealing. Did they steal something Christmas themed? They stole... 20,000 pounds of butter. <laughs> oh, come on. You've got to steal like a pear tree or something if it's Christmas. Okay, so let's actually be um, let's actually be very butter. specific about this. It was 20,000 kilograms of butter. Okay. Worth $200,000. But what kind of butter is But this was in Canada. So one of those numbers is much higher and one of those numbers is much smaller than you probably think it is. It was it translated into United States weird measurements. Mm -hmm. 44,000 pounds of butter mm -hmm. that was worth about $156,000. Okay. So that makes slightly more sense then, but still. <laughs> slightly? Yeah, I guess it does. <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, it was, uh, you remember when we had the, the guy that stole all the, all the gnocchi? In yes. Australia. Yes, yes. And and I, I strongly suspect that that one was an accident. The guy's like, I'm going to steal this truck, not realizing it was full of dumplings. Uh, this was orchestrated. They have security footage of a black SUV dropping four guys off. And then they broke into, like they broke through the fence and they stole the two trucks that had all the butter in and then drove away with it. And they so, found the trucks later with all the butter gone. Let's just, maybe this is like some supervillain, right? <laughs> right? It's like, it's like Mr. Freeze, but his wife, Captain instead of butter. dying of like some strange thing that needs diamonds, she just needs a stick of butter every 30 seconds. Otherwise, you know. Otherwise, and so, something yeah, horrible will something happen. Something horrible happens. I think that it is uh, perhaps a supervillain who has found out that one of the superheroes is lactose intolerant, and this is how they're going to destroy him. With butter. With butter. Ah. All the butter in the world. Uh, yeah, so uh, 200,000 Canadian dollars worth of butter stolen on Christmas Day in a clearly planned way. My favorite part is that the, they abandoned the trucks and yes. just took the butter. Like, where's the butter? What are they doing with it? And they, they left the trucks. How much are those trucks worth? The trucks are probably worth a lot. Take them to a chop shop, get them stripped yeah. down, get something out of them. How do you offload your butter, right? <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you go to the fence, right, and be like, I got good stuff for you. They're like, oh, really? Uh, cocaine, you know? No, I got, I got something no. even smoother. I got, I got premium butter. Premium. The best butter. What do you like? Salted? Unsalted? I've got it. I've got it all. You I've like got, it in those little florets? I've got 40 tons, or what, 40,000 <laughs> 40, tons? 44,092 pounds of, 40, of butter, okay. of premium uncut Canadian butter. <laughs> premium uncut <laughs> Canadian butter. Yeah. You snort it out of your pinky. I don't, I don't even know. Like, what do you use all that butter for? Yeah. How do you... Maybe, it's maybe. It's a movie theater. They maybe. need it for their popcorn. It's a movie theater run by the mob, and they just have principles and standards, right? <laughs> like, we cannot buy our butter. If we do, the other mobster movie theaters are just going to make fun They're of us. They're going to make fun of us. We don't want to let Johnny Law win. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're going to advertise, you know, come to Al Capone's movie theater. Pure illegal butter guarantee. <laughs> I'll have to use that as our tagline for the next Minicon. <laughs> Pure illegal butter guarantee. There's a title for this podcast. Yep. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> I don't know if that, that could can beat Wheel of Time uh, podcast, but we'll see. We'll it's, see. It's going to be quite the uh, quite the drag yeah. out fight in the comment section. Which one is the better? Which one is the better? Um so I, I have several more food heists for you, uh -huh. but we will save them. We will ration them. Okay. So if you sent Dan a food heist and he's not mentioning now, it's, it's in the queue. I know somebody sent me 
the one thing, um, and you know who you are and what it is. You sound like you're putting them in time out. <laughs> Don't let it happen again. No, absolutely. Send me all your food heists. Uh, that's what I want the mm. most out of life. What mm. is best in life? To uh, <laughs> see the food heists. <laughs> to, to hear to your... Hear the lamentation of the gnocchi sellers. <laughs> <laughs> to roll in the stolen butter and hear the lamentations of the dairy farmers who were expecting that to be used for premium grade uh, pastries. And instead, we're feeling Dan's bath with it. Man, you realize every time I see large quantities of butter now, I'm going to think, oh, there it is. There it is. Yeah. You have a suspicious amount of butter in your you fridge. Suspicious amount. The uh, buffet table here has a large pound of butter carved into a swan. That seems a little suspicious. That's that's butter fencing. Who gets that much butter? Right. Someone's fencing the butter? Yeah. I mean, it, you need to carve the butter into shapes <laughs> so it's unrecognizable. It's how they got the cereal like, no, numbers uh, off of the butter. No, that stolen butter was just in bricks. This looks like a bird. Yeah. This is totally uh, different butter. Mm-hmm. Yep. I don't know what accent that was. Do you know that um, the when... You buy and sell gold. One of the ways you can buy and sell gold is you just buy it by the number, right? Mm -hmm. And there are these reserves where your gold is kept and your gold is just this brick with a number on the bottom of it that's changed hands perhaps hundreds, thousands of times with nobody who's owned that Butter brick, has actually- That brick of bar, that bar like, of gold has ever seen or held it. So it's the, it's the NFT model. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I guess they're just uh, just just moving on with uh, how it was. But I, I find that fascinating that you're mm -hmm. buying and trading this thing that that could have been stolen years ago. Who yeah, knows? You don't know but, if it's still there. Yeah, I guess that's kind of sort of how stocks work, right? Yeah, I don't know. I'm not a money person. <laughs> kind of sort of how stocks work. Yeah, yeah, maybe. I just like buying pork futures. Did you buy butter futures? Man. Mm. Uh, no, I'm going to buy butter pasts. Yeah. They're a lot more valuable. Uh, there is a word for that. Let's see. Puts and is it a put? Um, instead I don't know. Of a, yeah. I, I made up a stupid thing. I, I'm mm -hmm. shocked to learn that it's real. Right. You can, uh, you, can, you can buy and trade things that you don't own by betting that they'll go up and down. And this is why we are writers and not stockbrokers, because we don't even know the terminology. <laughs> There's people out there who are like, yeah, I made 20 million off of GME. Come on. Mm -hmm. Brandon, just use the right terms. And I'm like, yeah, it's a thing that you, you put somewhere. Man, way back in the very early days of the uh, kind of Reddit yeah. stock... The meme stock hype that mm -hmm. happened last year. Uh, Brent Weeks was like just watching it like a hawk. Uh -huh. And every day he'd be like, I, should, should I get some of this? Should I get in on this? Is this going to be a real thing? And I don't think he ever did. Mm. But there you go. Bitcoin? Anyway. Do you have Bitcoin? I don't have mm. Bitcoin. I kind of think that do everyone you? are. I, I do. I have about a thousand bucks. Okay. I've... I finally came to this dis this determination that for me a thousand dollars is not very much okay right? um and I don't know that it's going to be the money of the future it feels like that gold bar thing except someone is able to put their fingers on the scale uh mm -hmm. a lot of someone's able to put their fingers on the scale it's unregulated and all of these things but on the odd chance that in 10,000 years this is the standard <laughs> Your great 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 grandchildren will be happy you bought that you bought some it. Bitcoin, yeah, uh, right? The kid who used to live across the street from mm -hmm. me, uh, when Bitcoin first started, he sunk like five hundred dollars into it. Yeah, and you know that was long enough ago that that's a ton of money now. Mm -hmm. Did he keep it? Uh, he kept about half of it. Nice. Um, as far as I'm aware, when did you buy a thousand dollars worth of Bitcoin? A year ago. Okay, so it's so. probably still around a thousand. Yeah, it's like twelve hundred bucks or okay. something. Um, so I, it's, but I just, I bought it not to be playing like I could play with way more money than that. Mm -hmm. I bought it to be like, you know what? This is like, yeah, potentially the thing we're on the ground floor of that. Thousands of years from now, I'd be like, oh, you know, this is like the gold rush. Yeah. Um, well, and I have to assume you have like an actual financial an planner. Actual financial and or planner. broker who's yes. like doing investments for you in real things. Yeah. While you're 
yes. screwing around with Bitcoin. Yes. Um, and so, yeah, it's um, we have we have like all the normal boring stuff. Yeah. So I wouldn't. I'm not. Wouldn't. Don't worry about Brandon sinking everything. I've got this new thing, <laughs> Dogecoin. It's the way of the future. Have people approached you to make coins? No. I get it all the time. I would 100% make my own Bitcoin, my own cryptocurrency, Uh given the chance. Would you? Oh, yeah. (laughs) Why? (laughs) Because because it's so dumb. Uh Uh, Because if I knew how (laughs) to do it. it's so dumb. (laughs) Because if I knew how to do it, like you could do, it is, as you say, completely unregulated. You can do the pump and dump and you can Mm -hmm. get all of, you can jack up the price. And that's why you want to do it? No, I would do it because I don't know anything about it. But I would love to say that I have my own currency. Like, it, for me, it would be the same thing as, look, I made T-shirts. Okay. Who wants one? It's like, like how Mr. They're not Beast necessarily is... worth anything. It's like, I'm just going to start a hamburger restaurant because I want to. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. I haven't done it. Um... The ability to come in here and say, hey, don't worry. Dinner's on me tonight. I'm paying for it in Dan coins. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't done it for or the same... when you buy dinner and then I'm like here I'll pay you back have and a couple Dan of coins? Dan coins and you're yeah. like what you, use are these would you call them Dan coins no I would not well, I, would what call would them, you call I don't them? know what I would call them you'd have to have like you know some cool some cool horror thing chop coins or blood coins or you know <laughs> something like that or is, is that just two on the I notes? would call them enemy tears because everyone enemy wants tears. to pay for things with the tears of their enemies. So here you go. <laughs> I will actually give you some enemy tears. It's changed on the market right now. Yeah. Tears. Here we go. Probably would turn more into Dan tears. Probably. Mm. What's going to happen is that I'm not actually going to follow through on this because I don't know how. And someone a month from now is going to hear this when we actually air it. And then they're going to make it. And they're going to tell me, hey, I made those things that you said you were going to make. And now I have them and you don't have them. (laughs) Or maybe they will write to you and be like, hey, I know how to make these things. I know how to do this. Let's do this for real. There you go. Yeah. Enemy tears. There we go. Um, I haven't done it for the same reason I haven't done NFTs. Did we talk about NFTs? Which is that it it would feel predatory? Yeah. Yeah. Um, So I have... Uh, and try to maintain a good relationship with my readers. Mm-hmm. And one of the things I try to do um, in order to maintain that good relationship is to not be predatory, yeah. right? Um, it goes back to me realizing that if I ask for things, people will give it to me and realizing I don't, you know, I can afford to pay for these things. Yeah. It's different from when I was a newer author that a gift like that is like, that's something I really needed and couldn't afford. Um, now it's I'm, I'm in a different uh, mm-hmm. state in life. And so not doing an NFT, not doing a coin where I'm, I'm like, the people who would buy into it would be the most loyal of the fans, right? And I something about that just feels wrong to me. Again, I will do NFTs if NFTs in years from now are a stable real way that mm-hmm. uh that digital and virtual art is exchanged and consumed and they've figured out the uh the environmental aspects and things like that yeah. i'm not i'm not saying nfts are scams what i'm saying is if i were doing it it would be to jump on the bandwagon to get some quick money and I do not need to be interested in quick money. I would rather maintain a mm-hmm. fan base uh, who knows that that's not something I'm interested in doing. Yeah. Uh, and coins feel the same way. Yeah, I agree. Which is why I'm I'm not in any particular danger of that per- mm. <laughs> that that problem. Uh, but I do love the idea, you know, of. But- Having a goofy thing. Like, for you, they can be a meme, right? Yeah. They can be fun, and they Mm -hmm. can be more than a meme. Um, For me, anyone asking me if I want to do this is coming to me specifically because my name will reach a large audience. Yeah. Right? Um, And that doesn't mean the people who have asked me if I want to do this are looking to scam those people. Let me make that very clear. Um, (laughs) Just, I am uncomfortable with it. Yeah, that makes sense. We're not going to get to the wheel of time in this episode, are we? Sure we are. We, we've only been talking for 15 minutes. So, uh, wheel of time. Wheel of time. 
Yeah. So uh, last time we talked about it, we had only talked. We had only seen two, two, or three two episodes. episodes, two or three. Yeah. Uh, and now we've seen the whole thing. The whole thing. And Our- you had been involved with much of the process. Yes. At least on a, in a consultory way. Yes. I don't know if that's a word. Uh, but you, as far as I know, uh, had never even seen a script for the final episode. Was it only the that's, final? Or? That's not quite true. Oh, okay. So what happened is um, I consulted, um, I had a lot more influence over episodes one through four-ish, one and two in particular. Mm-hmm. Uh, five and six, I still consulted on before they were filmed. And then COVID hit. Mm. And nobody knew what was going on and how they like, filming was interrupted. Um, lots of things were going on and I heard radio silence out of them uh, for a long time. I, I pinged Rafe and just like, he's like, things are rough right now. Uh, we're figuring out how to work with COVID uh, to get our last two episodes filmed. Yeah. Um, and somewhere in here, I don't know when, because I didn't hear about it till months um, later, there were issues where they knew that uh, Barney was going to leave the show. Is that um, Matt? Yeah, Matt was okay. going to leave the show. And um, is that something you can talk about? Nope. Okay, then I will not ask. Yep. Uh, and all I know is a sentence or two. Um, okay. Again, uh, don't over inflate my my involvement in all of this. I am happy and excited to be part of it, but I wasn't there in the writers' room. I haven't been there in any of the meetings. Mm-hmm. Um, like. The only meetings I was in were years ago when it was back at Sony and they were doing a movie and they brought me in a couple of times. Uh, everything else has been me meeting with Rafe, just okay. with the showrunner. Um, and so eventually they got in and filmed those episodes and I never saw scripts mm-hmm. uh, for seven or eight. And uh, came time for me to consult on season two. I'm like, you still interested? He's like, I'm still very interested uh, here. And he sent me uh, seven and eight. And then he sent me scripts for season two. Okay. Um, and so I've read, um, before this at all, before it even came out, I had read mm-hmm. um, some big chunks of season two. And I had then read seven and eight, but I read them without being able to offer basically any feedback. I mean, um, okay. I there are a few things I mentioned to him, but um, they were filmed uh, and you know post-production was going on and whatnot. So... Um, but so I, I, that's just a reality of how mm-hmm. the whole thing went. Sure. Um, that I was unable to be involved. I think that a lot of chaos was happening with COVID, with them trying to get uh, people in, like, you know, like a lot of the people they couldn't get back and they couldn't do crowd scenes mm. um, for seven and eight in ways that they that had wanted sense. to. Yeah. Because, and so they had to replace some crowd things with CG and stuff like that. Um, and just a very difficult time that I've only heard at this point secondhand yeah. um, about. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. So. Well, that, um, makes, that makes sense. So um, I think we can divide our discussion into kind of two chunks. Okay. There's the, the like, four, the three, four, five, and six episodes, really four, five, and six. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then there's seven and eight. Yeah, um, and um, that makes sense because four, five, and six, yeah, um, were, in my opinion, the the strongest the show as a whole felt to me. I agree. In hindsight, uh, reading through them, I really liked the um, the pacing in episode one. Mm-hmm. Um, but seeing it, it's more frantic than the story. Mm. Like the the. It's hard for me reading a screenplay to know how things are going to be paced. And yeah. I think episode one really needed another 30 minutes watching it in hindsight. Um, now, that's, you know, um, me also after after I switched my head over to this wasn't a straight adaptation of the books. Um, it's very d- dangerous in some ways for me to even talk about all this because the uh, the fandom is very passionate yes. about uh, yes. the Wheel of Time and very passionate about Wraith. And I don't want to, um, I don't want my criticisms of the show to turn into me saying, you guys are all right, if mm. that makes sense. Um, I think there are legitimately some things to talk about with the show. Yeah. I am not in the camp 
that um, that what Rafe has done is some tragedy mm-hmm. uh, and things like that. I think Rafe has done a good job. Yeah. Um, I think that he has adapted a very difficult book to adapt. He picked an adaptation style that suited his writing and his team's vision for it, and they executed on that pretty well. Well, well, let me let me ask a question then, or yes. let me frame a new discussion. Mm-hmm. Uh, the very final episode, yes, uh, was actually my favorite single episode of the show. Okay, um, I don't think that the series as a whole mm-hmm. holds together well. That the season does. The pacing mm-hmm. feels off. It doesn't feel like it knows where it's going or how to get there. That said, um. What I really loved about the final episode is that it is self-contained really great. And Mm. part of that is because it jettisoned Mm -hmm. some of the other characters. It has such a huge cast of characters. Right. And for the final episode, it's like, Perrin, screw that guy. Nenev, screw her. We're going to give Rand the best possible episode and arc that we can give him. Right. And so on its own strengths, it was really, really solid, even though the okay. season as a whole may have suffered for it. I can I can talk about that since I guess we're jumping to the, the, the second group. It's the most interesting yeah, yeah. thing to talk about with the show. Um, so I really enjoyed the Rand um, and uh, Ishamael stuff in episode eight. Mm-hmm. Uh, really enjoyed it. Uh, it hearkened slightly to the things that I did later in the series, uh, which are ran in that same character. So um, that you, 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 Ishamael so, uh, is not a name I caught during the episode, but that's the dude who shows up as like the personification yeah, of the dark is what one or they're whatever. calling. Yeah. So spoilers slightly for the series. Sorry. Sorry. Not just the television show, the books. So this guy is basically the dark one's right hand man. And the like the leader of the Forsaken. Um, and he was also Luce Theron's good friend. Okay. Um, in the past. Uh, yeah, which in, was like the cold open of that episode. Yes. Right. Yeah. right. Um, Luce Theron's, Theron's good friend. And the cold open of the entire book series is the two of them, is him showing up to talk to Luce Theron mm. after Luce Theron has gone crazy and killed everyone that he loves. Okay. Um, and the relationship between the two of them is like the first moment we get in the entire book series. And when it came back to the uh, to the books I was writing, um, Robert Jordan had had him fade and then was coming back as a more main character. And I spent a lot of time on uh, on him as a character mm-hmm. um, with Rand specifically talking and things like that. Now. Yeah. This is not to say that it's just things that I did because uh, there I was trying to build off of things Robert Jordan had done. Mm-hmm. And there's echoes of what you saw in this ending all through the Wheel of Time. What could have been is a main theme of the Wheel of Time because the turning of the wheel and uh, alternate yeah. – perspectives on where you could be and what you could have and what you're giving up. Opportunity cost is like the main theme. And there's Mm -hmm. a great sequence in book two that does a lot of these same things um, between the two of them. Um, And so I... That just really felt not only true to the books, but it was really dynamic television, uh, and it it worked really well. Presenting Rand with different options for the future and things like that. Um, and just kind of getting down to the core of what's he going to decide. I think that all just worked. It yeah. flew real well. It wasn't from the book, uh, the Eye of the Word World novel. Not really, mm-hmm. not in that way. There is okay. some, a little bit, but not much. It's it's more of a magical uh, battle and sword fight at the ending. Than, um, than the conversational thing. Than the conversation. Um, there is I, some I, conversation, but yeah. The, the actor they got to play that dude. Yeah. Did was a great phenomenal. Job. Mm-hmm. And so being able to just really focus in on him and Rand and Moraine, mm-hmm. uh, who are three of the best actors in the series. Yes. Oh, um, you think Rand was uh, doing a good job? By the end of it, yeah. yeah. Um, it took a while for me to really get to like him. Mm-hmm. Uh, but once he stopped being kind of the, I the John Grisham Warren, whiny wife Warren, kind yeah. of person... Um, then he, I felt like he really came into his own in that final episode mm-hmm. uh, in a in a really great way. And I'll say, I feel like the other really great thing that happened um, was 
others have disagreed, but I think that moment where you realize who the dragon was landed. Um, where you see from Which Rand's is the end perspective of, of episode seven, yeah. right? Um, where you see from Rand's viewpoint that he's been using the power all along, and he's known deep down that he can channel. Um, that uh, I think that landed. Mm. Um, I I actually missed that completely. Did you? It did not come across to me as okay. Oh, look, there's evidence that I've been channeling. It mm-hmm. was more flashback to all these scenes. I'm the Dragon Reborn. I, the dots didn't connect for me. That's. That's useful to know because I was expecting it, right? Okay. Because this is one of the things from the books that is done slightly differently. Uh, one of the genius moments of the first book that they didn't do in the show mm-hmm. um, is that all there's all these symptoms of the first time that you channel and what it does to you. And uh, Moiraine or someone, I think it's Moiraine, is explaining these to Egwene following the first time that she's channeled. She gets sick. She has a headache. There's all these like symptoms mm-hmm. and things like that. And in the meantime, Rand and uh, Matt are split off on their own thing. And all right, I'm getting my timelines wrong. <laughs> We've had this explained. Egwene does it. She feels the symptoms. Then you see the symptoms in Rand mm. at the same time parallel in his storyline and you realize Rand has channeled um it's just this really subtle way um of of saying look this guy can channel yeah. um even though you don't know it explicitly you can follow along what's happening to other people as they show the symptoms of mm-hmm. the first time they're channeling and then it's yeah. hitting Rand well uh, this... I explained that very poorly but no yeah. I uh, but I understand mm-hmm. it uh I this this may be my own lack of of familiarity with mm-hmm. the books and the magic system. Yeah, I kind of thought that the whole point of what was going on was all four of these kids can channel, and we just don't know which one of them is the dragon. Right. Um. And the the issue is that Matt and Perrin can't. Channel. Okay. Um. So Perrin can talk to wolves Perrin or whatever, can talk but that's to wolves. different. It's called wolf brother, being a wolf brother. And it's like an ancient thing okay. that's from. Uh, I just figured it yeah. was the same thing. Well, and that works kind of for the television show, right? So mm-hmm. they played up the fact that Matt had taken the dagger and they play up the danger of Perrin and the wolves to make you think maybe they could be the dragon reborn, right? Okay. Um, that's one of the changes Rafe made. Mm-hmm. Um, in the books, you know Rand is going to be the Dragon Reborn in the same way that you know Luke's going to be a Jedi. Yeah. Right? It's not like, you know, it's stated <laughs> outright, but, I mean, come on. hmm People have laser swords. Here's your main character. Guess who's getting a laser sword, right? Yeah. Um, and it's the same way with this. Um, and so... Um, y- in the book, you just you're you're watching for it, and just like in the show, I'm watching for how they're going to reveal who it is. And for me, that moment of oh, Rand channeled here, Rand channeled here, Rand channeled here did land. Okay. Um, obviously, it could have been done better well, for someone who was I, not I suppose expecting. In it. hindsight, mm-hmm. um, all these moments in which he channeled, mm-hmm. uh, I just didn't realize that meant he was the dragon. Right. Because we've already seen a dude channel. Yes. And and they didn't expl- uh, make it explicit that Perrin and Matt aren't channeling for the weird things that are happening to them. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. In the books, you know, if if a man can channel, it's, uh, it's a big deal, mm-hmm. right? Um, I, they'd make that a big deal in the uh, in the show but they also really play up um Loghain a ton yeah. in the show and so yeah um but anyway those are those were my favorite things yeah uh the things i didn't like and what made episode 7 what or episode 8 be feel like one of the weakest ones for me mhm um uh, was all that other stuff you're saying yeah it it doesn't i don't think it made a great cap to the season Mm-hmm. Though self-contained, I, th- I thought it worked really, really well. Uh, I am sad that uh, Nineveh, who was previously mm-hmm. my favorite character, kind of got dropped at the end. But pretty much everyone other than Rand kind of got dropped yeah. at the end. So, Yeah, I wish. But none as hard as Perrin. Man, that kid, he did not, I don't know. So there's a, <laughs> I, 
there's there's a thing like again i am we're talking about what's interesting uh to talk mm-hmm. about what could could have been and things like this i do not think the shows were terrible i am glad that rafe is in charge of this i think yeah. they did a good job yeah well um, and, and i did ultimately enjoy it very yeah. much and i'm looking forward to season two um but i uh one of the things when i argued against the plot arc for Perrin. Um, with uh, with Rafe at the beginning was I said to him, look, if you're going to put this trauma upon Perrin, you're probably going to have him dealing with that the entire season if you're going to be responsible about mm-hmm. it, which means that there's going to be no place really for him to go. Yeah. Um, he's at his lowest moment at the start of the show. And you're probably you either you will have to have him get over that really quickly, which would be unrealistic and mm-hmm. not doing uh, service to the trauma you put him through. Or you have to have him deal with the trauma. Uh, and um, by then they already knew what they were doing. Right. It's not like I. But they yeah. that's what they were planning to do is Perrin deals with trauma for the first season. And it turns out that it just didn't go really anywhere well he because he never dealt with it he never overcame it yeah uh the final thing which i actually did like i mm-hmm. loved that uh little traveling dude who turned out to be a dark friend yeah. and at the end he's basically just sassing off to perrin yes uh he was fun and they have his a great actor for his that fame. last thing mm-hmm. to perrin was you know that's you right yeah your your first reaction to everything is just violence um, which was this horrible slap in the face for him that I uh-huh. thought worked well, but it basically just said, yep, Perrin, you're exactly where you started. Nothing has changed. Um, now, seeing it all together, um, the revision I would recommend for Perrin, um, if I could have read through the whole thing, right, mm-hmm. and had time with it and whatnot, um, and I don't know that they had the time for all of this with COVID and things, but yeah. what I would have said is Perrin should, uh, if you're going to go with this whole thing with the, you know, I would remove the killing the wife at the start. We've yeah. talked about that ad nauseum. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're going to go with this thing, I would have Perrin decide to follow the way of the leaf, um, mm-hmm. by meeting with the tinkers. So that the tinkers have a point in the narrative. He picks that up. And he tries to not then fight back. Yeah. Um, and comes to the decision that this is not for him, right? Like mm-hmm. there's at least an arc there. Yeah. Um, some sort of uh some sort of thing. Now you could even do it um where he decides to follow the way of the leaf, and then he's being tortured by Valda, and that's the point where he snaps and says, No, way of the leaf is not for me. Um, and then acted in that moment. But then in the end, he berserks again uh, and he's really, really scared that like I'm Mm -hmm. too dangerous and like leaves after that. Right. Walks away uh, from his friends or something like that. Like build off of this. Have it go somewhere. Mm -hmm. Um, I I I really have as much as I like all those middle scenes, the scene with Valda, I just don't get. Valda's the white cloak guy. Yes. Okay. Yeah. The. Part of my issue with Perrin, mm-hmm. um, and I actually remember Perrin was my favorite character when I read Eye of the World, which is, is the one book that I've read. my favorite character for the whole series. Yeah. So, yeah. Really like him, which is why mm-hmm. I'm focusing so hard on him in this. Um, I don't know that I would know that his arc was one about, you know, use of violence and berserking yes. if you hadn't told me. Right. Because I do don't think it comes across. He does the one thing with mm-hmm. the wife in the very first episode, yeah. and then the rest of it is him feeling bad about that rather than him struggling to control himself. Right. I don't ever really see him doing that. And in fact, in the scene with Valda, mm-hmm. what I wanted more than anything else was for him to friggin' punch the guy in the face. Right. Uh, and he didn't, and I suppose in hindsight, that is, oh, good, you're controlling yourself. But at the time, it felt more like, yeah, Perrin just never gets to do anything cool. And um, in the equivalent scene of that in the books, that is a Perrin scene. Um, the wolves come in, two white cloaks end up dead. Perrin mm-hmm. killed them. Um, and that haunts him for the rest of the series. And that, re- so they replaced that with killing the wife. Yeah. In the books, he berserks like for the first time with the white cloaks, kills two of them. Um, and then uh, And then that kicks off his sort of, 
what am I? Am I am I a danger to the people around me? Mm-hmm. How much violence do I need to do to the world in order to prevent the world from doing violence to the people I love? Yeah, uh, that's basically the key Perrin uh, conflict. He's the big strong guy who's always held himself back because he didn't want to hurt people, mm-hmm. and now he's realizing that maybe he's got to hurt people. Um, yeah. So the the way that I would. I, I can think of mm-hmm. maybe three options of mm-hmm. how I would have done Perrin differently in a magical alternate reality where I get mm-hmm. to do Perrin. Um, number one, if you're going to start him, uh, because I do think it is, well, not in the books, yeah. an intriguing start. Have him hurt somebody important right off the bat. Oh, I right definitely think hurting someone important yeah. is, is, I was and on board then from the beginning. he struggles with that, mm-hmm. and we see with... Uh, you know, the the way of the leaf and with mm-hmm. all these other people, him trying so hard not to hurt anybody. Yes. And then, um, you know, have him come to some point where he makes that choice one way or the yes. other. Um, I also think it would be really interesting to have him start off more as, uh, you know, just a, a different rant. Yay, mm-hmm. we're going on a fun adventure kind of thing. And then halfway through, and maybe this is how it is in the book, halfway through, he gets tortured by the evil white cloak dude and snaps and kills him and is like, oh, wait, this isn't fun anymore. Mm. That would be an interesting path. Um, th- what I saw from the series mm-hmm. and what I was kind of hoping for the whole time was some kind of payoff to the wolf thing. And maybe that is books down the road. Yeah. But they built it up so much and then it never went anywhere. Yeah, that's one of the problems that uh, that is put upon Rafe rather than, uh, mm-hmm. th- like, I think Rafe has done a decent job of in- incorporating the wolves so that you'll be, so they aren't out of nowhere when they, they come in later. Yeah. Um, so, and uh, let's give credit where credit is due. Um, having a character who spends the whole season dealing with drama, or dealing with trauma, be unable to fight back at the end because of his trauma is actually pretty legit. Yeah. Um, it's not a satisfying traditional cinematic art, but it's pretty legit mm-hmm. uh, where they went with Perrin. And it's kind of a natural outflow of where they started. And it's kind of a responsible way to deal with the things that they're doing with Perrin. Uh, it just didn't feel that satisfying as a as a complete arc for a season, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and that's, that's the, the issue that... Uh, we're getting into like I think Perrin is just this special thing where they're trying to do something very different from the books with Perrin and I'm just not on board completely Mm -hmm. um, with it Uh, contrast that to Egwene and Nynaeve that who I think they handled really well all through the uh, the um, seasons and then or the opening episodes and then kind of had a drop for the last one I've got a fix for them that's a lot easier and I wish I'd been able to I wish I'd been able to talk I, about I this. I would love to hear it. Um, and so their arc for this season, both in the books and in the show, is basically, do we get involved with these Aes Sedai? They seem really manipulative. Um, we're not sure if we like the way that they do things. And yet they have the power in this structure. And maybe the reason they do some of these things uh, has good foundations mm-hmm. and that's their the, m- much you know naive's on the we should just not be involved with them and Egwene's like the voice of maybe we should be um we can both channel and things like that and the t- the show i think got that across pretty yeah. decently yeah i um, agree i think that your ending episode just needs then to end with them both deciding to go train to be Aes Sedai um and so mm-hmm. I don't know why they did the whole linking thing to fight off the Trollocs. I think it would be a really easy fix to have Egwene and Nynaeve need to be there to help with the defense against these, and they're just not trained enough. Mm-hmm. Nynaeve can't access her power the right way. Um, Egwene isn't you know can't can't control they and at the end of it they've helped out, but then they realize if we had been fully trained, all these people over here wouldn't be dead. Yeah. Um. We need to go do the responsible thing, go learn to use our powers. And if there's a hierarchy and power structure there that is that is messed up, well, then we fix it. Mm-hmm. Uh, we become part of the solution rather than just walking away. And if that, that alone had been there, uh, I think their whole arcs would be really great through the whole season. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, I suspect mm-hmm. uh, that... COVID may have been, and I hate yes. blaming things on COVID, but I, that in particular is like, 
COVID hit. What are we going to do about this big final battle? Yeah. Well, we're going to reduce it to a weird little metaphor with five ladies in the middle of an empty field. Like, yeah. that's the the social distancing version of the final battle. Interestingly, in the books, Rand destroys them, the oh. Trollocs. Okay. Um, Rand like takes the from power in the eye of the world. Yeah, uh, takes seizes the power, and for a moment is powerful enough uh, to do all kinds of crazy stuff. Mm-hmm. And he um, he destroys the Trollocs at uh, Tarwin's Gap and saves everybody. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's by by stepping up and uh, and meeting the Dragonborn. He gets that is kind of his that's his carrot. You got to save everybody. Stick is well now you're the Dragonborn and that sucks. Yeah. Um. You know. And deal with it, kid. Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, that that would have been interesting. Yeah. Um, Ny- Nynaeve was, uh, and I have said her name different every single time I've said it. It's all right. Uh, and and boy, did I get chewed out for it on the internet last time we did it. You just go episode. ahead and say it however you want. <laughs> the thing is, um, in I, I can't remember which episode it was. I think it was episode six. Mm-hmm. There were at least three different pronunciations of Moraine in that yeah. episode yep. that same week. And I'm like, okay, well, I don't care how I pronounce it. I love to tell this story, which is we were uh, um, Elaine. You haven't met her yet, but her mother's name is uh, is Morgays. Um, mm. And I was sitting at Team Jordan's house um, and I said, how do you say her name? Um, and two of Robert Jordan's assistants said it in a different way. And then one said, no, he said it, he said it like I said it. And the other one was like, no, 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 he said it like I say it. And then I'm like, all right, all right. I know Robert Jordan was a bit of a stickler for how the pronunciation should be, but he's not around anymore. And his assistants can't remember, uh, which is the correct pronunciation. I'm okay if I occasionally get, uh, Ruidian wrong or tell Aaron Riode, or if you get Moiraine's name, yeah. uh, you know, yeah. and they they do all kinds of things in the show for pronunciations of Moraine. Okay, so speaking of Moraine, mm-hmm. let's go back to that four, five, six yes. trilogy of episodes that all took place in the White Tower. Yep, uh, which I think were the strongest the yes. series as a whole was because that mm-hmm. is when it felt the most cohesive. Uh, that's when it felt like it had a strong through line and I knew what was going on and where it was headed. Yep. Uh, it really hung together really, really well. Mm-hmm. I agree with you. Um, my favorite when I was reading the episodes was six. Seeing them filmed, it's four. Um, uh, Nynaeve is one of my favorite characters from the books and seeing mm-hmm. her come into her power and uh, and do things um, like Let's she see. did. Four is the one where uh, where Loghain almost Loghain breaks Loghain out. Almost breaks out, and yeah. she she channels out and for channels. The first time. That mm-hmm. was such a good episode. Yeah, I really loved that. Uh, I loved all the different Aes Sedai. Mm-hmm. Um, and then five is. Uh, so five is they is all are getting to the, the one White Tower. Where the and they, the warder. Five dies is they at the all end. get to the White Tower. Yeah, I think it is because six is told. Ex- the reason I like six the most uh-huh. um, is in the the screenplay. It was only Moiraine's viewpoint. They said we're going to do something different with this episode, and it's mm-hmm. it's subtle in the show, but you are never seeing a shot that Moiraine isn't there in the room. We're mm-hmm. always seeing basically through her eyes. It's a day in the life of Moiraine at the White Tower. And it's the one that ends with her getting exiled. Yeah. Um, and they pull the nice little switch reversal with Swan, um, who's the Amberlin seat, um, okay. where you think that Swan hates her, and then you realize that they're a couple, mm-hmm. um, which is a, um, they were a, in the books, they were a couple long before they aren't a couple when the show when the books begin uh but it's a it's a nice sort of um it's it's within character to put them together in Mm -hmm. this and it plays really well i felt and i just felt that all seeing the different aspects of warren's life where you're like seeing her not just as i said i hoarding children uh who don't want to listen to her but in her different relationships with all the people in the tower. I just thought it was really a cool, well-written episode. Mm-hmm. Um, but seeing it, it became like my second favorite just because that moment with Nynaeve is so powerful. It's such a Brandon <laughs> moment when someone finally uses their yeah. powers. Uses so. their powers, saves everybody. Yeah. Um, I actually think five, the middle of that trilogy, might be my favorite. Mm-hmm. Um, especially, I mean, I... 
and 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 I've had conversations with fans of the books. Yes. Who are like, why do we have a whole episode about this dumb warder we've never met before? Right. Um, which I disagree with. I don't feel like at that point I really knew who anyone was, except yeah. maybe Moraine. Mm-hmm. Um, and so spending uh, an episode getting to know this warder and his I said I, and then yeah. another episode watching him deal with the trauma of it. I was yep. totally down for that because mm-hmm. it was this really great consistent thing. And then the final scene where they're mourning him, I thought yeah. was incredibly powerful. Yep. Uh, really, now, really I'm, enjoyed I'm it. I'm there with you on that. Like this is this is where the series sh- shown, mm-hmm. uh, where the the acting chops of the actors were really on display, um, uh, where you were, it was really interesting world building, but in a subtle way. Um, all three of these episodes are just great. Yeah. Um, now the I will say the cold open of six, where we meet the Amberlin seat as a child. Yes. I was one hundred percent lost. Oh yeah. And maybe that is a fault of me rather than the show. But it was like we got to the end of that scene, and I'm like, wait, who's this kid? Mm-hmm. Why does she have to leave? Why can her dad not go with her? Like mm-hmm. I had no idea what anything was going on and then realize several scenes later oh that was a flashback mm-hmm. what is up with this show yeah. uh but that once i put all the pieces together i liked yeah, it a lot was definitely there for the fans because swan is f- one of her main character quirks is that she's this she's the most powerful person arguably in the world mm. right as the amerlin seat um and she came from a rural fishing village and she still uses fishing metaphors for everything she does. And okay. so you'll have this really powerful uh, woman everyone's scared of and she'll be like, well, it's time to gut the fish. Um, and that <laughs> contrast is just really... Did she use fishing metaphors in the episode? I don't remember. She did once or twice, not as many. But mm. you that could become a joke really quickly if they did it too much. Yeah, yeah. And so I thought the show actually handled it right. Uh, you don't want it to be... Um, you don't want it to turn into, you know, mm-hmm. the Kramer who's like has a catchphrase or whatever. Yeah. Kramer's a bad one because yeah. he doesn't have a catchphrase. But you know what I mean. But but um, he does, you know, like the yeah. way he comes in the door and yeah. things like that. Um, speaking of cold opens, mm-hmm. the cold open for eight um, yeah. with oh. Luz Theron. Yeah. Which, again, I... It was, it was a weird flashback and it mm-hmm. was out of place, but it worked for me. Okay. Uh, because... I realized at some point during the conversation, oh, wait, I know who this is. Right. And I know what they're talking about. This is a previous cycle of the thing. This is the guy that broke everything. And then the camera pans outside and it's this funky science fiction world. And I just thought that was audacious and really fascinating. That's uh that is very audacious. They still haven't shown the prologue of the first book of Wheel of Time, which is basically that only he's killed everybody. Mm -hmm. Um, But... Uh, my favorite cold open is the birth on Dragon Mount. Uh, maybe my single favorite little. Uh, oh yeah, thing. was that seven? That's eight. Or no, that's seven. That's seven. Yeah, yeah. that's seven. Um, the birth on Dragon Mount is something that we hear referenced all the time to the books. It was filmed really close to how I imagined it mm-hmm. uh, in the books. It and, was good. Um, it has a really nice payoff in that episode where at the end, again, Rand is accepting that he's the Dragon Reborn. Mm-hmm. And we hear, you know, we see how he was born and how, you know, uh, how he's Aiel yeah. and all of this stuff. Um, it's uh, it was it was really nice. That was one of the things that coming to the show I wanted to see. Mm-hmm. Um, and the fact that they put it in, I think is great. They yeah. did a really good job uh, of it. I think they did a good job. And mm-hmm. as with the the season eight or mm-hmm. the episode eight thing, I figured out, yeah. you know, once once she started going into labor, mm-hmm. uh, I was like, wait, holy crap, is this Rand's mom? Or I can't remember exactly which mm-hmm. point I figured that out. But right. it was Thanks. interesting on its own and led me to a realization that was a lot of fun to have. That's um, another one where I bet there would have been more soldiers there in a war if it hadn't <laughs> been filmed during COVID uh, protocols and things. Um, but Maybe, they did just a fantastic but, but as job. As it was, it worked as yeah, like refugee on a battlefield. Yeah, rather than this is the middle of a war, it still played totally great. For yeah, me. I think it 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 was an awesome yeah. moment. Um, uh, we are running out of time, but there's one oh, more thing are. I want to talk about. Oh yeah, what what do you want? What do you want to talk about? Lan, Lan, Lan. Lan doesn't do anything in the last episode except run to find Moraine. Yeah, um, yeah. 
Lynn, oh. uh, I if mean, I, if I'd only been able to, because <laughs> they have that beautiful moment, top down shot in episode one, where Lynn is protecting Moiraine, mm-hmm. that is partially there because I asked them for it. And it's so beautiful. <laughs> Imagine if she's channeling. He's channeling and, and he's he keeping her, Trollocs away. Which is the perfect, this yeah. is what a warder is for. Imagine if in the, uh, this one, he'd run off to go find Moiraine mm-hmm. while, and saw that the Trollocs were coming. And then you do the thing that I'm asking for where Nynaeve is fighting, but she's not good enough mm-hmm. and things like that. But she is killing some Trollocs and one almost gets close to her. And then same perspective shot, Lan appears out of nowhere and gets the Trolloc. And for a few moments, they're fighting together just like Lan and Moiraine were. That would have been awesome. Wouldn't that have just been the most beautiful scene <laughs> um, that you could imagine? Uh, yeah. It, uh, that it would, would have been, been really great. Would have been and like- it would have been such a cool payoff to their relationship. Yes. Uh, which I did enjoy. Right. That um, Lan goes back for her yeah. rather than chasing after Mo- Moiraine. Mm-hmm. Because Moiraine left him on purpose. And Nynaeve needs him mm-hmm. right then. Ah, that just- that would have been so good. It would have been a really but cool But I didn't get moment. to give feedback on these ones, so. Uh. Oh, well. Yeah, as it was, all he did in that final episode mm-hmm. was kind of run through uh, the creepy forest. Yes. Which we are told is dangerous, but we never really see yes. it. Uh, except in a dream sequence, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then, yeah. I don't know. But like I said, everyone got dropped in, in episode mm-hmm. eight, which for episode eight's own individual purpose. Uh-huh. I I absolutely support their decision. Okay. Um, I am sad that so many of the other characters did not get the payoff I think they deserved, but... What'd you think of Loyal? Loyal, he's the tr- ogre guy? Ogre, Ogier. Ogier. Mm-hmm. Uh, I liked him a lot. Um, he didn't... I mean, he was just there. Yeah. I get the impression from almost every character in this series that mm-hmm. they're way more important than they appear to be. And they're just like, he was a guy who was there and he said some stuff. And his only function that he served in the mm-hmm. plot was, I'm going to take you to this gate. Yep. Um, and I kind of get the impression that they needed him specifically for that. Yeah, because the Ogier built the, the, those oh, okay. gates. But, yeah. uh, I liked him a lot. He was, he, he was one of the most fun, uh, like his dialogue mm-hmm. and his personality were so different and so unique. He was spot on from the books. He's really? one of my favorite. They just did an amazing job with oil. Um, perfect. Couldn't wouldn't change a thing. Um, cool. Really happy. So um, what what is an O'Gear? Uh, an because o- they did yeah. kind of some Star Trekky face and hair yeah. that made him say, "Okay, he's basically human, but he's not human." Yeah, that's basically. I mean, they are um, they are giant sized humanoids who are from the previous age. And now mostly live on these little secluded, uh, they call them steadings, um, Mm -hmm. where the um, weirdness is involved, the one power can't channel there, stuff like that. But it's basically they're like Robert Jordan's version of elves or something, the mythical creatures from a previous age that are lingering Mm -hmm. into this age that won't be there when our age uh, comes around um, and... Yeah, Loyal yeah. Is, a, is, is a character um, throughout in the books, the whole series. Who knows if he survives uh, through to later series in this one. <laughs> but uh, in the books, uh, I wrote a really cool scene with him uh, for the last books that get cut. Uh, I had to put mm-hmm. in deleted scenes. So. Alas. Mm-hmm. Let me ask uh, one question and yeah. I guess give the non-spoilery answer. Mm-hmm. Um, season two. Yes. What what is book two about? If book one yes. is the quest of let's figure out which one is the dragon reborn and get him to the eye of the world to yes. stop the thing, uh, what's book two? So book two is called The Great Hunt, and the book two is they find the Horn of Valier at the eye of the world. And this, they got it out from underneath the, um, the throne. Mm. Um, mm-hmm. It is a magic horn that when you blow it, all of the heroes from past ages who have been waiting, who have been there so heroic that instead of getting reborn, they're bound as spirits to the horn. Okay. And when you blow the horn, the heroes from times past, including, you know, Arthur, Hawkwing, um, and people like that. So, yeah. um, like King Arthur and people mm-hmm. like that come and fight alongside the heroes of this age. Okay. Um, so it's like a reversal on the Tolkien ghosts that were the the whatever. Yeah. In this one, if you can whoever blows that horn, so if the good guys blow it, they'll join the good guys. But if the bad guys blow it, 
it's a little ambiguous, but they're pretty sure they'll have to fight for the bad guy's side. Um, okay. Or something like that. And it was the Dark Friends that took it. And the Dark Friends the throne, took right? it. And in uh, the books, the Dark Friends take it, run off with it, um, and the uh, the whole team has a, uh, a quest uh, narrative to chase them down. Oh, cool. Um, and they are headed toward that place where the Shan Chan, you saw them at the end of... Um, of episode eight that's the stinger at the end where the invasion force arrives uh it involves oh them. yeah mm-hmm. um and um i don't know why they decide to throw a giant wave at a little girl um um <laughs> says, screw that little girl yeah uh if but Karen doesn't get a good ending neither does she uh but in uh in the books they are a major force they are um king arthur arthur hawkwings king mm-hmm. the the ancient ancient he's not that old but yeah um they're the saxon army invading they're the from saxon across army the sea. army invading yeah. from across the sea this the saxon japanese army oh, okay. um mixed mm-hmm. uh from across the sea coming to invade that have channelers yeah. that are chained up and uh forced by special things to obey them that was all super cool mm-hmm. so, so i'm excited so that's uh that's book two, um and so we'll see how season two how season proceeds. two I assume season two is going to include more than just a single book because book one did as well or season one did but anyway there we are we'll be back in a year <laughs> in a year to talk more about it how's that Ben. Uh-huh.